Welcome back to What's New with Mead, episode 24. Today, I have a very special guest to Mead. This is Ricky Klein from Grow and Foam Eatery, someone I have looked up to for many years now. Um, and I get to have this fun opportunity to talk to him. Uh, we're going to get to learn about Grow and Fell, his mead theories, and everything else. It's going to be awesome. So, Ricky, welcome. Glad you're here. Absolute pleasure to be here. Hey, so I want to start off um, by getting to know you as um, not just, you know, your YouTube channel is highlighting um, you, of course, but also lots of grown fell behind the scenes things. I would love to know, just starting off, like where, uh, where did you start with mead? Did you make mead from the beginning? Did you start with beer? What'd you do? So I brewed everything under the sun, uh, beer, wine, cider, sake. Um, sake is my, uh, my Goram white whale. I will, uh -huh. I will never, uh, have a good batch of sake. The fact that anyone can do it is a miracle to me. Uh, so the first thing I brewed, literally the first batch, I got, you know, a starter kit from my local homebrew shop and brewed one beer. And then my next batch was a mead. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that was uh, I lived in Denmark for a while and mead is a huge part of their culture, except you can't find it anywhere. Mm -hmm. So it would be like being an exchange student to the United States being like, oh, where's this apple pie that you guys are always talking about? I'm going, oh, yeah, yeah we don't make that anymore. <laughs> That's like things our grandmother made. Yeah. So since then, uh, Denmark has had a mead renaissance, uh, much like the U.S., but I absolutely positively could not find it. And so the only way to get mead at that point in the state of Vermont, I don't think there was anyone, uh, even Chaucer's wasn't available here. Oh, wow. So we're, we're the end of the year. <laughs> but I brewed my, uh, my own, and it was god-awful. Absolutely terrible. What was it? Um, was it a traditional? Did you It was a straight crazy? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, um, so you started – I feel like that's a lot of story for everybody starting with a beer or something. I, I don't know of many people who have solely started with mead as yeah. their first uh, homebrew project ever. I think that's a little bit scary. Um, and I don't know that I would recommend it for most avid starting homebrewers because you learn a lot more mm -hmm. when you try to understand it as fermentation and not this one magic beverage. Right, right. You so know, what as you... a beer brewer, you know, I don't know anyone that started off and said, I'm going to brew a Cascadian Dark 50 times until I get it right. No, you brew a Cascadian Dark, you brew, you know, a pale ale, you brew IPA. For sure. Do you still brew any beer or anything else like right now comfortably? As a, as a home brewer, um, yeah. I took a break. I took all of my equipment uh, actually to work. We So there are weird regulations. You can't have any beer in a winery like at all, even mm -hmm. as a home brewer. But mm -hmm. luckily we have um, a very large building and part of it isn't our winery. Okay. And so I built my brewers a homebrew closet. Oh, that's cool. So it's, it's a smallish room, but they've been using all of my all grain equipment there like on uh -huh. the weekends when they're not working. So do you do, um, not to sidetrack to Gronfeld, but with Gronfeld stuff, do you use that room as like an opportunity to do test batches of things and, and experiment? My home, uh, my, my brewers like to use it for that. Um, I'm not much of an experimenting guy. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fair. That's understandable. Um, so I did my time, as, as we like to say. I did a freaking Friday every Friday for two years. Yeah. So that's yeah. 110 test batches, and I'm good. Do you have a favorite um, style of mead to like you like to brew at this point, or are you? Ooh, my favorite to brew. That's a tough question. Um, my favorite thing to brew at our facility. Uh, specifically because we've got some new equipment to make it easier, is Hop Swarm, a hopped mead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I had that one, it's actually. A, it's really good. Yeah, it's got, a, it's got a lot more steps than everything else I do. Um, the one that is my – and it always has been, actually, since um, back in my, my baby homebrew days, is strong straight meads. So mm -hmm. anything above 18%, despite the fact that until literally six weeks ago, we didn't offer one Yeah, um, for a variety of reasons, but it really takes, it's the only thing, everything else is, you know, might as well be a chemist. I mean, yeah. it's better if you're a chemist, to be honest, <laughs> but a, a strong straight mead with nothing but honey, water, yeast, and yeast nutrient. Mm -hmm. 
is the real test of a mead maker. I agree. I think that that traditional mead, um, now, I always caution people to not start with traditionals because like you said earlier, it's hard to make a good one. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like it's probably arguably the hardest style of mead to master because you're so dependent on the, on yeast and honey selection. You are a hundred percent correct. So uh, um, if you were on that topic, if you were going to suggest a, someone to start brewing mead, what kind of recipe would you suggest they begin with? So, it depends on what their goals are. Mm -hmm. so if your goal is to end up making a, you know, knock them on your rear end, 21% honey bomb. Yeah. Um, start down that path. Try making a straight mead first. See where you go wrong. Read a lot of articles, watch man-made mead. And otherwise, um, mm, if you want to brew a good mead, brew one good beer, mm -hmm. and then do something like Joe's Ancient Orange. Okay, yeah. So, and um, I, I think to that effect, it's like important to start with a recipe and not try and craft your own recipe from the start. Um, I definitely, I think that can be a little bit dicey. That's where a lot of people get frustrated and probably give up on mead making is they, mm -hmm. they just go rogue and they try yeah. to do something crazy. From the start. I mean, that's the reason we're an open source company. Every one of our recipes is free online. That's why I did ask the mead maker mm -hmm. for all those years. When I started, there was Shram's book, uh, you know, the godfather of, of mead making. Yeah. And it was helpful. Um, you know, I started in, gosh, you know, 2007. Mm, okay. Um, 2006, 2007 as a home brewer making mead. And there were very few resources, even on the internet at that point. Um, and we've also learned a lot in the last 10 years as more commercial mead makers have gotten into the game and really had to, you know, you can sit on a home mead for heck a year, Yeah, but if you're going commercial. It's not really viable for most of us. So when did you start Groenfell? Was it pretty quickly after you did, you started mm -hmm. home brewing or? or? No, I actually went off and got a, a master's degree in a completely unrelated field. Hey. You know, I was paying for my master's degree by working at a homebrew shop. Okay. And this is where I really started making mead regularly because I realized, I mean, I love beer. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. absolutely love this stuff. Um, I, I was a competent enough beer brewer, competent enough to advise commercial breweries. Um, that said, I was never going to have the best double IPA. And I realized that I could knock out a batch of mead in the five minutes mm -hmm. before I hopped in my car and went to work. And that's really why I started making so many of them. Yeah. What? It was just a, a question of time. And I had access to all the world had to offer the best ingredients because I was working at this homebrew shop and I could order in 20 different mead specific yeasts and play around with them. Uh, that's now available to everyone now that online ordering is a big thing. Right. But what happened was the three guys I worked with were all really, really uh, competent beer brewers. They were great at uh, bold experiments. Uh, everything I know about sours, initially I learned from one of my coworkers who now is also a professional, uh, he's a beer brewer, but they just didn't do the meat thing. And so people would come into this store and if they had a meat question, they sent them to Ricky. And what happens when everyone asks you the questions is eventually uh, you either have to become the expert or get exposed as a fraud. Yeah. Yeah, that's... <laughs> and I'm both. No. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, okay, so um, a couple more questions about you, and then we can switch over and talk about some of these other things. But one that I didn't list on there, I want to ask you, what's your favorite kind of honey to use mm -hmm. um, of all your experience? And then mm -hmm. not necessarily talking about growing fell specifically, but do you have a specific yeast that you found yourself using most commonly? Yep. So my favorite honey to use, okay, I'm going to out myself here the cheapest raw honey that I can get my hands on. Mm -hmm. To be honest, that that's my home brewer. Yeah. Um, I need to know that it is raw. I use True Source certified, have since I was a home brewer to make mm -hmm. sure that what I'm putting in there is 100% honey and not rice sugar. Um, we do use local honey for all our wild series at the meadery, so mm -hmm. playing around with those. But there are a bunch of different kinds of mead makers out there, and I'm a technician. 
Um, I, I will, I'm not an artist. I'm a technician. I love the process. Mm-hmm. I have innovated and innovated and innovated in on a commercial scale, how to get honey, water, and yeast together in a tank. And as silly as I, the world needs us. Um, I could talk to you for the next 40 minutes about the array of hot water delivery tanks that I developed. Oh. That's not... That's not what home brewers want. And that's why I rely so heavily on, especially two of my brewers. Nate's been with me the longest. He's our, our senior brewer now. Mm-hmm. And Jake is our packing technician. And he does all the canning line stuff and has a real hand in a lot of the recipe development still. And those are the guys that have, they're the artists. They're okay. the ones that, you know, like uh, they developed a blueberry coffee, maple, cinnamon, vanilla mead with... <laughs> maltose additions to give it body so that it will drink like a you know like there's cream in it but oh man we're kosher and that would de-kosher our tanks um but that's the kind of stuff these guys can come up with and wow. the fact that i've made literally hundreds of needs means mm-hmm. that i can at least consult with them yeah but they're the ones now at this point that have a lot of the vision our entire sour series was developed by those two that's wild man yeah. um so i love using consistent honey because my fascination is yeast which i know is your next question (laughs) i would rather play with yeast and fermentation temperatures Mm -hmm. than experiment with different honeys and there's a there's a guy out of britain who is the world's leading expert on saint john's work for whatever reason Mm -hmm. it's been you know 50 something years and that's Mm -hmm. all he researched every day and then he retired (laughs) And they gave him his access card back so that in his retirement, he could go and research it more. And this to me was like utter madness. I mean, that's like the working definition of a crazy person to me. And then I realized that that's how I feel about yeast. Uh And I could spend the rest of my life dialing in the system around Hmm. making those four ingredients do what I want them to do. Yeah. So, Within that, uh, um, to me, it sounds like you like to experiment around with yeast and, and play with them. Some do you, is there a strain you use most commonly yeah. at this point? Ninety-two percent of what I brew, I looked up the number because I, I thought you would ask. What uh, <laughs> comes out of our building has D forty-seven in it. Okay. Uh, in the case of all of our, so our sour series does not, mm-hmm. and our wild fermentations in general. Um, all of our meats still have the wild yeast that comes with the honey. We don't do anything to kill it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the D47 is the workhorse of 90, 90 to 94% of what comes out of that building. And what I like about it, and i uh supposed to have an article published in a, a major brewing magazine, and they wouldn't let me do it. They said it was too controversial. Oh, They recommended fermenting at 92 degrees with D47. And... Oh my God. I ended up on a, do you know, basic burn radio? Uh huh. Yeah. So I ended up talking to James about this. I was like, how is it that I was so controversial that I was like banned <laughs> from major <laughs> publications because I said that I fermented really hot. And I know that the little package doesn't say that. You didn't stay between but, 59 and 68 or whatever it says. No. <laughs> and then the other thing is, um, and this is one thing for all home meat makers there is no such thing as over pitching. Mm-hmm. You can't over pitch yeast. Like right. you can try, try. It will bankrupt you before you can successfully over pitch yeast. Mm-hmm. When people's spouses are like, oh, it's too yeasty for me. That's actually because you didn't put in enough yeast. Yeah. The secondary metabolites of stressed yeast are the number one problem with mead. Mm. I mean, literally number one. I did a competition where I judged 400 meads. And the number one off flavor, which up until about five years ago had the name Young Mead Off Flavor because no one knew what it was, um, was a misapplication of um, simple nutrients. So people who use uh, just DAP by itself, Mm -hmm. you can actually burn the yeast with that. Interesting. Okay. Uh, Yeah. I mean, it's uh, literally burning. I mean, it's... Yeah. Uh, figuratively, it will actually cause oxygen stress and literally burn the yeast cells. And that's where a lot of your off flavors come from, which is why 
for all home brewers, I recommend getting a complex nutrient blend. Mm -hmm. uh, y yeast is the one we get because we can buy it in bulk. Uh -huh. But Crosby and Baker is what I, I grew up on. Okay. Um, you'll just have happier, healthier yeast. Mm -hmm. um, but you can push D47 into like crazy territories. We did one batch because one of my former brewers, I didn't fire him, he just is now like a musical mm -hmm. director, um, forgot to turn a chiller on and a batch got to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, <laughs> and it kept going? Oh, yes it did. And it finished its fermentation in 31 hours. <laughs> and uh, it was the most popular version of that mead that we had ever made. But I was like, we are not going over 100. So at this point, do you have a house strain of D47 you're using? I did. I did for a long time. Um, so we'd pull it, repitch it. Valkyrie's Choice uh, or our base mead, which are very similar, um, they will get repitched three to four times, but usually additional yeast on top of it. Um, the reason we stopped is one, we now have a company that will take our yeast and turn it into biogas for us. Mm, um, we're actually a 100% renewable facility. Wow. So all of our electricity comes from the sun and all of our natural gas is renewable natural gas. That's if you want cool. to switch to that, sorry, you can't. It's only available in Vermont and Germany right now. Uh -huh. Some parts of California, I think, maybe Massachusetts, but they're working on it, rolling yeah. it out in places. Um, yeah, so they'll actually take all of our waste, all of our hops, all of our yeast and everything and put them in a biodigester, create natural gas, and then put it back into the pipeline towards us. That's super cool. Uh, yeah, wow. so we realized that it came down to the thing on a, a commercial level, money. Yeah, um, yeah. We were spending so much time harvesting our yeast mm -hmm. and trying to keep the strain healthy. Mm-hmm that we figured out that it was costing more staff hours than just pitching fresh every time. Okay. And in one of our batches, I put two and a half to five kilos of yeast. And it was still cheaper to just do that. That's, that's insane. Um, have you noticed because you, well, I guess you use house, a house, house strain for a while, excuse me. Um, when you are pitching new D47, let's say, mm -hmm. over the years, do you ever notice any changes in mm -hmm. the um, yeast process or flavor? Yeah, so output? we used to, the other thing that I got um, razzed for um, was I used to just sprinkle all my yeast right on the top of my batch, no rehydrating or any of that mm -hmm. nonsense. Um, and I was a big advocate for that. That's how I homebrewed. I'd open up my bucket, I'd sprinkle yeast on the top as long as it's well oxygenated, it'll be great. Mm -hmm. um, we had a couple stuck batches, which we saved, um, but we decided to do a new rehydration process. Uh, we started at the advising of another meadery, Sticky Paws. Um, they're a local meadery up here. She's a biochemist and recommended GoFirm. Mm -hmm. We've had great success with GoFirm. Uh, really increased our cost per batch because it's it's not cheap um, mm -hmm. to use it the quantities you need to on a commercial level, but we've we've never had a stuck batch since. So okay. that uh, again, I I am a big fan of the double blinded uh, study. Mm -hmm. So we are an N of one, but following the process of using GoFirm and we actually use our nutrient because we use a mineral blend from Y yeast. Uh, we use it partially to give body, mm -hmm. so the way that brewers would use brewer salts um, or brewer's minerals. So we use much, much more uh, per gallon than is normally recommended for just yeast health. Mm -hmm. But because it's not uric-based or DAP, uh, it doesn't doesn't harm the yeast. It'll just fall out of solution if it doesn't want it. So I want to uh, circle back to that DAP question a little mm -hmm. bit. since. You talked about it burning the yeast and, and harming the yeast, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed, is that specific to um, when you front load with DAP pre-fermentation mm. or when you try and do a staggered nutrient schedule? Have you noticed any difference between those? I, I don't do staggered nutrient scheduling for any of my batches, uh, with an exception that we'll get to in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, and also because I had very poor results with DAP and uh, when I began judging, uh, it was one of the biggest problems I saw. We actually stayed away from it. Yeah. Although yeah. it is by far the least expensive um, 
nutrient you can add. It just didn't. I mean, to me, it's like giving a person a steroid injection rather than giving them dinner. Yeah. And I know that's not entirely accurate, but I have a good friend who is a, a PhD researcher on yeast and uh, she does really cool stuff with it. Actually, she develops antibodies um, to hmm. fight uh, snake venom with oh. yeast. That's why she's <laughs> an expert. Uh, just, she's really cool. Um, but basically, in laboratories, they don't feed yeast that way. Yeah. And if you want, I mean, that's the thing. If I'm talking to, so I give uh, lectures pretty regularly to uh, brewing students. And one of the things I say is if you want to focus on one thing, it's yeast health. Uh, beer, beer is the ultimate beverage, right? Like it's got all the nutrients that your yeast could possibly want. You, humans can live on it for months. Mm -hmm. Yeast can live on it for months. Yeast cannot live on mead. Humans yep. can't really live on mead. No, there aren't the complex nutrients. There aren't the vitamin complexes. So focusing on yeast health is huge for anyone especially when you're going commercial um the literal um hydrostatic weight uh the compression on top of your yeast can harm it really so that's the only real thing that's different between being commercial except for the temperature control that we can have mm -hmm. um the real big difference is you're now dealing with liquid volumes that the weight itself can harm your Yeast. Interesting. I never, never thought about that. Um, especially at a commercial rate and, you know, yeah. volume, you guys are definitely dealing with it quite a bit. Um, is that, does that correlate to, um, the gravity starting gravity? Uh, you know, can that, can those two things go hand in hand? Mm -hmm. Um, so anything that's a stress, anything mm -hmm. that stresses your yeast So that'd be high alcohol, high sugar content, low nutrient load, um, hydrostatic pressure. Now, initially you won't have hydrostatic pressure because almost all wine strains and beer strains will, uh, uniform, uniformly, um, propagate throughout a liquid volume. So mm -hmm. all throughout your bucket, but over time as flocculation begins, they'll settle to the bottom and that's where you can get autolysis, which is why if you're doing a craft mead, so mm -hmm. anything, you know, under 8% that's going to end up carbonated one bucket no need to clarify, don't need secondary, mm -hmm. but anything more than that, if you're going to be doing something with extended aging, that's when you need that secondary. It's because you'll have autolysis of the yeast, which will then barf back out the, uh, yeah. the things that it's been so kind to uptake from well, the meat. That's funny you mentioned that. I, I did a video on that. Um, it's probably been six months to eight months, but I'm actually putting it to the test now. Um, these two things right now, it's two gallons of meat. They're going to be virtually the same because they're fermenting with the same yeast and not everything. I'm going to leave one on the lees and just let it age like that and then pull the other one off and wait about mm -hmm. a year. Yep. Um, I was going to say, you won't see much. Um, you'll get, you may get even in ideal conditions, uh, your dissolved oxygen is going mm -hmm. to be a huge um, complicating factor. But I'm, yeah. I'm definitely curious. Um, it's one of those, I, I love doing A-B testing on, on the channel. It's like the science side, uh, uh, super interesting. I didn't know I was going to get into the science side until I started this Mead Mythbusters idea. Um, and it's been just a, a blast to... Okay, so before we started recording, uh -huh. I told you I would tell you something. Yeah. Um, you may have noticed, uh, this was an intentional decision. So I never missed an episode for something like seven years. Um, even when my daughter was born, we pre-recorded a bunch of episodes and then she was so late. She was 14 days uh -huh. late. We almost didn't have enough episodes, but we never missed an episode. And then, um, after I saw you tasting my mead, I went and watched your channel and I was like, there's no need for me anymore. <laughs> That's not true. You, no, it's true. You are. So we had, I had talked with my team about doing, you know, like I just answer questions. I answer five questions an episode at this point. That's, you know, I've answered like 700 questions. And that means that I've answered a bunch of them a bunch of times. Some of them are like silly personal questions. Like I was hit by lightning and someone was like, is that true? I heard that on a tour. I was like, yeah, here's, yeah. here's a picture where it happened. Um, but like most of them are, are mead making questions, mm -hmm. but I met with my team, my two brewers and my marketing 
friend and we were like, if we want this to be valuable, because that's our role, it has to have some value for the customer. Um, we need to get into the nitty gritty. We need to start doing real experiments. We need to sit down and maybe do a whole episode on autolysis. Maybe we need to do a whole episode on coffee editions where we add our coffee five different ways. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm not going to do that, guys. You can. More power to you. If you want to spend three hours a week and up the production value, go for it. Uh, but all the brewers, um, the three of us who are active brewers, there are three other people on the team who are all our budding, budding brewers. Mm -hmm. um, all of us were like, nope, there's there's a guy that's got it. We're good. Oh, man, that's that's a lot of pressure, but that, that's good. really kind of you. <laughs> yeah, no, it, your show's amazing. Well, I appreciate that. I have a lot of fun with it, and... Um... Uh, I think I said this uh, at the beginning, but whenever I first started doing the YouTube thing, again, like you said, you were, you were going strong yep. and I, I was, I loved getting to watch your stuff. So um, I hope that you'll still put some things out, but I know I, that it I takes do, time. Um, I record something every, every three or four weeks, cool. uh, still a uh, response to something specific, usually something that I had to do a big, like, I am sorry, this is why you ordered your meat, but it's not there yet. Um, we we had a recall. Oh, um, yeah. I did a thing about that. Recalls are horrible. Mm. Um, it was the worst recall we had. We've had we've had two, mm. um, and they like you know one is like oh these are leaking because our seamer had failed. Sorry mm. that there's you know your meat is flat, but uh, this one was not that. This was me royally royally screwing up. This was one hundred percent me, all on me, rookie mistake. Uh, so I I went and talked about that, but yeah. Well, can I, let's talk into that if you want to. I want to ask, um, with your homebrew experience, and you can even talk about commercial if you want to, what's the, I guess, biggest mistake you would be willing to talk about that you've made? I would talk about anything. Um, so, again, open source company. Mm -hmm. you, don't learn, uh, you don't learn from when I get things right. You learn from when I get things wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so, we had a vote. Uh, so all of our meat is dry, 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 dry. doesn't taste like that because honey has a set of compounds that tricks your brain into thinking it's sweeter than it is. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we've all had that experience where we've had a 16% mead that's, you know, 10, 20 final gravity. And we take two sips and we're like, this is really good, buddy. And then you just, your brain won't let you do anymore. Yeah. It, it's palate fatigue so fast. Mm -hmm. So we committed to doing really dry meads got a lot of flack for it. This doesn't taste like honey. And I would always say, well, beer doesn't taste like cereal. <laughs> the goal is to take yeah. one thing and turn it into something else. So we took a vote and Old Wayfair, which was our worst selling product across both of our brands, Grand really? and Havoc, far and away, we almost discontinued it. And then we started selling online and it jumped to number two. Hmm. We sold the amount of old Wayfair in six days in August that we sold in all of 2019. Wow. We'll give you an idea of how much more popular it became. And people really liked this one batch that we screwed up. Mm -hmm. And so we had to, replicate a screwed up batch and it wasn't made to be screwed up it just ended mm -hmm. up sweeter than i like its final gravity was oh, 1006 1008 mm -hmm. and for your your listeners um you know our starting gravity is low enough that you know we're a 6.8 percent final product on that so that's mm -hmm. that's that is absolutely a perceivable level of sweetness and we just don't we just don't have the the skill set to keep our meat sweet so we did two batches sulfite sorbate and cold crashing. Mm -hmm. um, but we were so behind on orders and our packing team was, I don't want to blame them, but they made it seem like life or death. Yeah. And I like, you know, when you're, when you're in the heat of this thing and they're getting the angry phone calls from customers, you want to help your team out. Mm -hmm. So we started cold crashing at nine o'clock on a Wednesday morning. And at one o'clock in the afternoon, with the cold crash nearly complete, we threw sulfite sorbate in there and canned it. Well, mm. Guess what? Mm. I know where the... uh -huh. oh. <laughs> um, Six gravity points is a lot. Yeah. A lot. That will take... Uh, can has a working pressure of about 4.2 PSI. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can at 
uh, sorry, not 4.2, sorry, 4.2 volumes of CO2 mm-hmm. with a maximum of six. So volumes are what we use in the commercial world. So I can't remember the exact PSI conversion, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, we made literal bombs and like, <laughs> one blew up and hit a guy's kid. Like, oh my gosh. Like, bad day. And oh, you know, he's no. like, and then I was super nice about it. He's like, no, no, no. I was just super embarrassed because everyone else was drinking white claw and I wanted to be cool drinking mead. And I was like, I'm still going to send you a replacement. I am oh, sorry. man. Um, but no, that's that. Um, both of our recalls, one uh, was because the paper by hydrometer slipped. Uh-huh. And so we had a misread on the final gravity. And again, same thing. We had popping cans. Mm. Uh, but the old Wayfair cans were popping dramatically. So, um, uh, yeah. With the sorbate sulfite and cold crash in combination, is that, do you think it didn't work because, um, this is my hypothesis, because mm-hmm. I've had something like this, because the, the liquid was cold and the sulfite and sorbate didn't have the capability of mixing into the... Um, I don't think that's what it is. I did, uh-huh. uh, so all of us got, I, I bought like $100 worth of research papers on the subject and all of us read them. Um, yeah. Sorbate dissolution, uh, based on temperature uh, is a real thing that none of us really knew about, but we had never had that problem. I put them sulfide sorbate in at 34 degrees for seven years and mm-hmm. never had a problem. Okay. Um, the issue is that it was actively fermented in 9 yeah. a.m. And five hours is not enough. Um, there are two things that you cannot compress liquid and time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. We tried to compress time. And so what we did is hired this kid um, he's gotten used to being called daddy when he's 21. He just graduated, uh, all things with a distilling degree, which is a nominal use to us. Um, but what he's really good is at is, uh, those QC components. Mm-hmm. And so he, and he also is because he hasn't been with us for years and years, like a lot of the other people on the brew team, we gave him a uh, 100 with one exception. Um, we gave him complete veto power. So he can say, this does not meet our, our qualitative or quantitative specs. You may not package it. I do not care how stressed the packing team is. I do not care mm-hmm. how stressed the, the PR team is. You are not packing this today because we are never going through a recall again. Yeah, um, yeah I can only imagine that being. <laughs> and the only person who can veto him is Kelly, my wife who owns the company. Uh-huh. Um, theoretically, she could, she could veto his veto or override his veto, yeah. I think, more commonly the term. Um, but yeah, and it's been great for us. He spent weeks and weeks and weeks designing the hardest thing for a food product mm-hmm. uh, is those qualitative analyses that you can't lie to yourself about. Mm-hmm. So I think all of us have been there even home brewers who are like, oh yeah, no, this is great. What do you think of my pale ale? Yeah. And your friends being like, oh, thanks. <laughs> like free booze, thanks. <laughs> yeah, and then down, down, you know, out into your lawn and then it kills the grass. You yeah. Know. Um, but at a commercial level, you, you can't live like mm-hmm. that for long. Um, and having people you can trust to be like, uh-uh, is really big. Yeah, I, I can see that being super important. Um, I'm, man... I can't imagine at the grand scale doing 500, 600 gallons of something. That seems a little bit terrifying. Um, But you guys have obviously have a um, method to your madness. And I kind of want to ask you about, because I know it's different um, hop additions within Mm -hmm. commercial meads. I know there's like this threshold where you can only put X amount of hops and, and whatever. Can you speak into that? Yeah, so ignoring the FDA and TTB regulations on the subject, um, which are more often misunderstood uh, than they're not important. Mm -hmm. What matters is how you get the hops in. Mm -hmm. So I, one of the questions you're eventually going to ask me, I might as well answer it now. How many iterations does a batch go through before we package it? Zero. Okay. Um, my wife, for reasons that are to this day absolutely unclear to me, has allowed me to brew a 1,000 to 2,000 gallon batch of every one of our products to launch it. With like no test Man. batches. Yeah, I don't <laughs> know what you're thinking. Um, That's awesome. But, 
Yeah, it's terrifying. I mean, we almost <laughs> lost a 2,200 gallon batch of meat the other day because someone forgot to turn a temperature controller on again. Um, you have a little sign on it that says, before you leave, make sure that- <laughs> uh, That's what Cody's for. That's what the kid is for. Yeah. He is, he is there to put those signs up. He has a, he made a new, uh, he actually programmed it himself. It's an app that has all 10 of our tanks on it. Mm. And you tap it and it will tell you what the next step is on your brew day. Hey, there you and go. And so like, you can't, you cannot go forward until you hit that checkbox. Yeah. I uh, will not let you progress. Well, when you have uh, so, 2,200 gallons on the line, you, uh -huh, you better be yep. hitting those boxes. Yup. Uh, do you want to know who forgot to turn the temperature controller on? Me. Oh, it no. was me. I had been asked to do it remotely from my phone because mm. I can control our glycol system and um, the link didn't go through. And I just like completely forgot because it was the week before Christmas and I was on my way home. Oh, man. Uh, oh, no. It's the first night of Hanukkah. Uh, I was mm -hmm. getting, I was like rushing home to make latkes for my family and um, yep, just completely forgot. Anyway, so it was fine. We saved it, but terrifying and that can never happen again. Yeah. So, um, so with hops, we we're on that. So we went through, I think 10 different techniques, um, hop swarm, uh, which is originally called something bitter bee. Problem was it wasn't bitter because we know nice summarize our hops. Uh, mm -hmm. The very first iteration of it uh, was our one and only test batch. Mm -hmm. And it was eight kegs worth, so, you know, 40 gallons. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't even have a thing small enough at the time to, to brew that. So we had to like borrow someone else's yeah. fermenter. Yeah. So I could brew five gallons. I could brew 10 five gallon batches, but I couldn't brew like one, one. consistent 40 or 50 gallon batch. Um, so we got, I had this great idea of how I was going to do it, boiled up my water, got my hops and the stuff poured green on draft. Mm. I loved it. It was like hop juice. It was like alcoholic hop juice. Uh -huh. And Kelly, who's a huge hop head also was like, this is perfect. And all of our customers were like, I would not buy that. Like, oh. Damn it. <laughs> so we realized the real problem with it is you lost, first of all, you completely lost the honey flavor. Mm -hmm. And two, if you want hop juice, there are people making that. Yeah. yeah. What we wanted was something that allowed the honey to shine through. Mm -hmm. No reason to make meat if you can't taste the honey or at least the, the bio constituents. Um, but we did an iterative process where we would tweak our recipe every time. And finally, I found this company called Bubba Tanks. Like this is like this year. Interesting. Uh, and they make 100 gallon temperature safe brew kettles and fermenters and with false bottoms. Mm -hmm. And so they're not cheap, but I bought one for my brew team, insulated and everything. So the way we do hops is, uh, I think it's the only recipe that we have on our website that isn't accurate to what we do because it's a little much for most home brewers. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna update it though because I now trust everyone to either follow our recipe or not. Yeah. Um, do whatever you want, <laughs> brew and brew. Um, so we do a 60 minute addition like a beer, mm -hmm. but we're working with a huge pot of water and that water is 185 degrees. And the reason it is 185 degrees is that is the maximum extraction point for flavor compounds and aroma compounds without isomerization of the alpha acids. Okay. Now you get moderate isomerization at those levels. So our final alpha acid level, our IBUs might be two or three, but because we're doing it on the exact scale we are, you actually get beta oxidation. So you get more bitterness from the beta acids oxidizing because they have so much surface area compared to a beer brewery. Mm -hmm. And because they're not boiling, it's not constantly evacuating that space above it. So 60 minutes, we throw in you know, 14 pounds of hops, something like that. Then it depends on the size of the batch. Right. Um, right. You know, 14 pounds at 60 minutes, 14 pounds at 50 minute, 15 minutes, 14 pounds at two minutes. Then we hit that thing with cold water and we pump it into a tank that already contains 
a completed mead or a mead that has uh, 10 gravity points to go, somewhere in that range. Okay. And that tank will also already have the uh, dry hops in it. Okay. And the reason we do it in that order is because it's easier to pour dry hops in through the manway than to go up on a ladder 14 feet in the air and pour them through the little hop port that's four inches around at the top. Yeah. So um, we were using hop bags inside the tank, mm -hmm. but one, hauling them back out was a nightmare. <laughs> okay. um, can because imagine. that tank is full of CO2 and small amounts of sulfur compounds when you go in. And with a brew team of six, um, I was still the only one that was allowed to do it. I just wouldn't let any other brewer. Um, yeah. I can hold yeah. my breath for like three minutes. Um, most humans can't. I mean, most humans can. They just choose not to work <laughs> you know, still. Uh, yeah. But you're in a tank that if you take one breath in, you're you're done. You know, mm -hmm. you're out. And, and yeah. as we've started to grow, really grow this year, uh, the first thing we did was we just invested in safety things. So we've made it so no one ever has to reach inside a tank again. Uh, we got a clean in place system so we have a thing that we can push a button and cleans our tanks so people aren't mm -hmm. dealing with um acid five ppw is great like i think i said once you can drink ppw i think i was thinking of star sand but anyway <laughs> don't, don't drink your cleaning that's solutions just like that you can and it won't kill you yeah um, you can't drink acid five um you, wow you know, you can drink it once like i, edible, I had never once. once i've definitely i think everybody has the same um experience of opening your currently fermenting thing and then you get the you know Oof. co2 smell and it's just like your nostrils flare and you feel like you're about to die i, I hadn't thought about that on the grand scale when you get to those. Uh, we actually so my daughter comes with me to work every single day uh she's three and a half and she is not allowed to come into the brew house on certain days because we will actually build a level of co2 up to a foot off oh, our wow. ground yeah uh, so she's more than a foot tall, but you don't want her bending down a tire right. shoot or something. Um, but we are on a really active fermentation. So my brew house floor is 6,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. just, just the brew house area, right? Like, so it's, it was enclosed. We, we've since removed walls. So there's more area for the things to disperse, but mm -hmm. 6,000 square feet. We once got so much CO2 due to four active fermentations and a canning run that my then VP of sales, who was 5'1", couldn't come into the space. And I was like, that is not okay. That's not safe. We're <laughs> never doing this again. Yeah. So, um, so how do you combat you that? Stinks, um, we open the door. <laughs> Just leave the doors open? Yeah. yeah, we have a door, like we have a door near the, the packing area and it will literally just fall out and That's good. on a really active cleaning, cleaning and brewing day which means we're evacuating 2000 gallon tanks that are pressurized with CO2. Mm -hmm. um, my brewers actually built a system that will pipe the CO2 right outside. So you no longer oh. have it running down the floor, man. But on our craziest day, it was like a humid Vermont summer day. You could stand outside and see the CO2 walking down the stairs. And I was like, never again, <laughs> never again. We that are going wild. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so in 2021, we are going to be actually using a CO2 reclamation system on mm -hmm. uh, cleaner and scrubbers so that we, one, are closing our loop. Um, we'll package up that CO2 and send it along to growers and things who could use it. Um, and more importantly to be like, keep it off the floor. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. okay so that kind of brings me into one of these questions that I, I think you saw. Um, so uh, what was one thing that you were not properly warned about when you uh, opened your meadery? So uh, the last three episodes of my show that I did were uh, things I wish I had known before I started mm -hmm. and things I'm glad I didn't know before I started. And there are a lot. So for your listeners, they want to know things about mead making Mm -hmm. I couldn't even begin to list the things that I wish I had known. Um, in 2013 or 2014, we figured out that we had published more articles about mead making than anyone but mead making made hard. And then eventually got me like blew us away. Yeah. Uh, like most of the research was do being done by me for me. 
like in crisis situations. Um, so there are a lot of things. Um, is that stuff available somewhere? Like what? if someone wanted to find your your yep. research, where, where where can they find it? Uh, so it's all on our blog, all okay. free. Um, I'll put that down in the description of this if you're interested in that, listening to this. Yeah, yeah. so uh, everything's on our blog. Uh, all of it is somewhere in a YouTube video also, mm -hmm. except for some of our really uh, things about additions for different types of herbs. Uh, that one, I bought every book I could find and it still didn't help me out on a commercial level. Mm -hmm. um, there are a bunch of really silly things about being a commercial mead maker that you wouldn't think about. Like, how do you get a hot bag back out of a cone? Because yeah. we use conical fermenters. And like my uh, my weekend brewer, Tyler, he just built this like pole fishing thing out of a hauling strap yeah. and a piece of uh, I-beam, like a small, a, small, a small strut okay. to like catch the hot bags and drag them up and back out um, wow. I mean, there are all sorts of things like that that you just don't think about when you're mm -hmm. going to a commercial level. The biggest thing that took me the longest to establish is if you want 100% pure, unadulterated cranberry as a home brewer, <laughs> you go to your grocery store. <laughs> There's going to be someone selling pure cranberry juice there. If you need 4,000 gallons of it, who do you call? If you need a 55 pound bag of rose hips. Oh my gosh. Who do you call? And so some of the thing, these things you can Google for. Yeah. Uh, rose hips I actually found through Googling. Yeah. But if you're talking about tanker trucks full of things, there aren't people selling tanker trucks. Yeah. On websites that you can Google for. Um, if you need, I mean, we're currently using 9,200 pounds of honey a week. Oh my gosh. How? Do you, you find someone yeah. that can get you that consistently, ethically? It's not. That's, yeah. Uh, I think that um, one of my things I would love to do in life, if I ever have the time and, and I'm willing to give up teaching, uh, I would love to start a meadery. But the biggest thing is what you're talking about. It turns into a grand scale. And I think one thing that's really fascinating and really cool about you guys is that you have you clearly have your recipes down and you um, are reproducing them perfectly in my opinion, in that you're not having to adapt things. Um, so I would love to be able to nail down three or four recipes and be able to start something like that. But I think as a home brewer and as somebody who talks to people who want to do the meadery thing, um, we have to prioritize that, that, uh, consistency, consistency. That's, and just that's, what, that's what Nate, Jake and Cody are for. So my favorite brewery here in Vermont, I probably shouldn't say who it is because I'm friends with almost all of them, but <laughs> um, I'll, I'll go ahead and do it. It's 14th star brewery. Um, they actually, they just barely tipped the scales to be my favorite brewery because they sent my wife a case of beer in the hospital after we delivered. Um, so <laughs> You know, they're the perfect great gift, company. literally the perfect gift for. After yep. that. <laughs> oh my God. She hadn't had any, like any sugar yeah. uh, it was yeah. or alcohol for nine months. Um, just because of what we were eating at the time, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of Viking food at our restaurant. And so she, um, she took one sip of it and she was like, I can't drink this. It's too sweet. <laughs> like it was oh. a double IPA. And it was way too sweet for her. Wow. Um, she gotten back on the wagon on that one. Um, she, she can drink again. Don't worry. <laughs> but actually not currently we're expecting our second but hey that's exciting um yeah nine months of sobriety she'll do it at least twice. <laughs> but um we I absolutely love these guys and their former head brewer who's now working with another brewery i told him one time i was like i hope this isn't an insult but this batch of tribute is my favorite one <laughs> and he goes thank you because they he's like i just can't stand brewers you're like it's not better. It's the same. Every single batch is the same. Mm -hmm. He's like, no other profession pretends that it's exactly the same and never getting better. And sometimes when you try to get better, you goof something up. Mm -hmm. And that was us with old Wayfair. You know, we were trying to bring something in line with what our customers wanted. And we ran four experiments at the same time on one batch. Mm -hmm. And that was the wrong number to run. Yeah. The right number to run was one Yeah, at yeah. best. But yeah, we're always tweaking. 
Um, we're always trying to improve our recipes. The consistency comes later. But what you need to know from my perspective is, can you take honey, water, yeast, nutrient, and whatever else you're going to add mm-hmm. and get it to finish? Can you get it to go from those things to a need that people want to drink? Right. Then comes consistency. Then comes flavor improvements. Mm-hmm. And if you could be consistent with a pretty good product, that's better than being inconsistent with a product that's sometimes awesome. Yeah, for sure. And um, I, I have fallen prey to this many times, mostly because the YouTube channel. <clears throat> I feel like I have to make new content all the time. And so I'm constantly like, let's throw something else in here. But I have a few recipes that I'm working on uh, mastering and, and just trying to quote perfect because I want to have some house brews mm-hmm. that are, are solid. So I think that every home brewer should experiment, but also, you know, work on get work on perfecting something if you can mm-hmm. to the best if of you your ability. Pro, that is the number one thing. And that's why I said, like, I'm a technician. Mm-hmm. Um, artists don't usually make good business owners. And uh, my wife and I are both technicians in our own areas of the business. Mm-hmm. Um, I spent an hour and a half meeting with my brewers the other day. I was like, your recipe sounds great, but it's not going to work. Mm-hmm. Like there was a thing about it that isn't worth getting into, but it's like, guys, this is just physically not going to taste like what you just said you wanted to taste like. Yeah. But I can help you with that. Mm-hmm. Um, your concept, my expertise. And um, I was really pleased with the product they came up with in the end. You know, I couldn't have made it. Yeah. Well, and I think that, um, you know, on your scale, you're getting to do this with, uh, with colleagues who are helping you guys are adapting recipes and perfecting things as home brewers, your colleagues are your friends. Um, mm-hmm. and hopefully you have some quote colleagues that can actually speak a little bit into, um, how things taste and not just say, Oh, it's good or bad. Not that those are uh, bad things to say, but you don't gain anything from someone just saying, Oh, that was good. Or that was bad. Do you have to hear First- specifics? first five years at a commercial level while I had assistant brewers, none of, they were like assistants. They were, I would like hold that chain. Mm -hmm. They were not brewers on their own. They had not developed recipes on their own. And it was, you know, we had interns for years and years in the COVID world. We, we've stopped doing interns temporarily, Mm -hmm. but um, I will have one in the spring under the new conditions of his school. But exactly what you're talking about. It was really tough. It's tough to be um, an N of one. Be like, I love this. My green hop juice being a perfect example. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So here's the number one piece of advice I give to people who want to go pro. I've given it something, according to Kelly, 12 times Mm -hmm. on my channel um, and innumerable times in person. If you want to be a professional mead maker, find someone to run the business. I don't care if you have an MBA. Mm -hmm. Have someone run the business. If you want to own a meadery, Find someone to brew. I don't care if you have 11 Mazer Cup gold medals around your neck. Mm -hmm. Find someone to brew the mead. And the reason for that is early, early on, six months in, tons of delays. We had run out of cash. Um, We needed this batch of mead to go to market. There was no market for it. I mean, Mm -hmm. I believe to this day, if you Google define craft mead, it's a quote from me that comes up as like Google's definition. It's like no one was asking for craft mead. Uh-huh. Um, a few people out there, bee nectar, um, superstition, just like made it a category. Mm-hmm. And then all the rest of us are just in their wake. But, you know, there was no one in New England uh, really making a, a beer oriented craft mead. Mm-hmm. And our, our glycol system broke. Like the pipe, a main blue, all the glycol all over the floor. Oh my God. Kelly and I had built it to try to save money. We tried to build it ourselves. Uh, I hired someone. Um, but pipe broke and I was on the top of a ladder. I don't know if people know, but glycol is a um, liquid sugar solution, actually. Um, so it's super slippery. So I'm <laughs> oh, balanced no. on the top of a ladder. My wife is underneath me. The glycol is 106 degrees, like dripping down on us. And I look down and I was like, the thing that sucks is not only do I need to fix this thing somehow, I know how much we can't afford to fix it. Yeah. 
And that's the thing. And this is all small businesses. Mm -hmm. Things are going to break. Things are going to burn. You're going to get bad reviews. You're going to get great reviews, but Mm -hmm. bad reviews are much more powerful for your own psyche. And potentially in this world where everything's on social media, um, a couple bad reviews can ruin an entire business. And it might be that they don't like you. Yeah. Um, You know, we're a woman owned business and we get a lot of hate about that, Mm -hmm. that we like mention that fact, which is insane to me Mm -hmm. because I did not realize that being a woman was a political decision, but um, we had someone basically say that. So That's that's the thing being a home brewer versus being commercial. One of your buddies doesn't like your meat. You'd be like, whatever, you have bad taste. All of your friends don't like that batch, whatever. Mm -hmm. But when you're like, you not liking my need just because you expected it to be, you know, I love Don Smield. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But like, I can't drink it every day. Um, I don't don't have the kidneys for it. (laughs) Um, Strong liver. I don't know about my kidneys or pancreas. But um, we have people with, you know, a lot of hate out there. It's like, oh, it should taste like this. When someone says that, on an ad or one of your posts that are free. Like we don't charge for anything. Mm -hmm. Um, Our show, all of that. You're like, Oh, that's the difference between me feeding my family and not. Yeah. That's the thing that most people who, and as I said, I used to consult with breweries and startup breweries, same piece of advice, exact same thing. You need someone who can take the brunt of the criticism Mm -hmm. and protect the brewer. And you need someone, and you, you, that person, you have to have a very strong relationship where they can be like, but no, this is actually broken and you need to fix it. Yeah. Um, and you need someone who can look at the numbers and on a bad week say like, I need you to find an extra $10,000 in sales. Do you think you can do that? And then you um, go, no, but I'm going to try anyway. Yeah. No, I, that is, I think that's great advice. Um, it, well, obviously you guys have a collaborative team and your, your company doesn't work without a, the collaboration of people. Um, obviously you started with a smaller group, but I think to be most successful, you got to work with more people, especially, uh, well, as you were talking about that, I was thinking about, you know, like starting a YouTube channel and you experienced this, experienced this too. The moment you put a video out, and you give any sort of opinion, you are opening up to the world of public opinions. Mm-hmm. And that, that can be people who just, like you said, don't like you just to not like you or don't mm-hmm. agree, which is fair. You can yep. not agree. But yep. um, same thing. Once you put yourself out there as a metery, you are going to get criticized for good or, or bad. Yeah. And that, that was the thing. So it was just Kelly and Ricky for the first couple of years. And then we brought on two people, uh, then we had a restaurant for a while. So that brought the much larger staff, mm-hmm. you know, nine of us or 12 of us. Um, and then we had six of us for quite a while. Uh, in June, we had six employees. In July, we had eight. Uh, as of today, we have 29. So it's mm. been quite a year. Wow. That's awesome. Um, yeah. We've had, we've had a really, unlike everyone else, seemingly, we had a really good 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, huge support from our community and it was the things that we had sort of lived by for years which was you know when we did start to see our sales increase we gave all of our employees raises and Kelly and I took no more money than we've been taking because we're fine we know we're fine and uh, you know we're a B Corp and that's I don't know if your listeners know but a B Corp is the highest level of social and environmental sustainability that you can get as a business. Uh, it's actually a UN recognized oh, that's awesome. label. Huh. Uh, and it's a, it is, I mean, over a hundred hours of compliance a year Man. Uh, to get that little logo on your can. But what it does, you know, for some people, it's like an advertising thing. Like we did it. We're sustainable. We're, mm-hmm. you know, environmentally conscious. We support our community. But for me, it was a list of things that I had to be accountable to. Mm-hmm. Like all small business owners, all business owners, um, you might make the wrong decision on a bad day. Yeah. Um, but we we have, we're, not only are we open source, we are, all of our financials are open for public scrutiny. Mm-hmm. Like everything, which is scary, super scary. But Yeah, I, oh, <laughs> that's a lot of public, public eye. <laughs> yeah. But it, it, 
it helps you if you have a mission. Mm-hmm. Our world is to help people feast again. Yeah. And it's a weird mission to have in the COVID world. Um, so we're trying to help people make it through this so that they can gather again safely. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's, you can look at things if you have a core mission and mm-hmm. no matter how, no matter how strong it is, uh, on a bad day, you worry about not losing your house. And so I will, I have said it publicly uh, before in our seven years in business, there were two occasions on which we decided to buy food for our child and Kelly and I would just scratch in the house. Hmm. Like that's what you're in for when you're a small business owner. It has nothing to be uh, about being an eatery. It's, yeah. Yeah. it's a big job for anybody. Well, and, and I don't think um, you're a great testament to being successful within this. And obviously there's been some hardships along the line, but um I myself can say I've, I've tried you guys' meads and I am, I really love them. And I have no doubt that people who try them are going to enjoy them as well. I have two last little questions. Um, and they're ones I re- I'm really curious about. These are kind of like ones for me, not necessarily. You want to add ones. one codicil before you ask your two questions. Uh huh. Two weeks ago, after seven years of saying this thing about don't do it, it's terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd still give that advice to anyone who wants to start a small business. Like don't do it. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, I was sitting around with my breweries and something had broken and we had lost like thousand dollars worth of CO2 oh. and it just leaked. And I got over the weekend, everyone's was fine, but like thing broke. And I was sitting around with these guys all socially distanced, wearing our masks. And I was like, you know what though? A bad day here is better than a good day at any other place I've ever worked. Mm-hmm. And that's not how it starts but eventually you get there and that's about the people you work with and not about what you're making. Yeah. We got to do what you, what you love, you know, at the end of the day. That's so it's always about the people. Uh, that's so true. Um, yeah. Don't, don't get yourself stuck in a job you don't want to be in. And yeah. I think that's great. Bad days yeah. can still be good days. Yep. And, and if I understand, um, there are plenty of people who don't get to choose what they do for a living. There mm-hmm. are people in this country that aren't lucky enough to be able to say like, Hey bank ran out of money again. Can you wait a month on the mortgage? Um, that's, that's not normal. Um, that's not how our country unfortunately works, Mm -hmm. but we, it's scary. There are people that work way harder than I do for way less. Um, but what I'm working for is, is getting to hang out with my team every day. Yeah. Regardless of what you do, spend your money on what matters. And what my what matters to me is time with my friends and time with my family. So absolutely, absolutely. I think that's that's perfect. All right, my last two little questions. Um, so one is about fruit additions. Mm-hmm. Um, within your homebrew and commercial experience, do you prefer to put your fruit in primary versus secondary? Do you use mainly juice bases? What do you guys do? Commercial level, all of our fruits, with one exception, go in primary, mm-hmm. and we use a lot of them, and we use primarily pure concentrates, and the reason we use concentrates is because we can, you can get fruits that you can't get otherwise. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you can't buy, I mean, maybe you can buy blueberry juice, but you'd be getting it in a tanker truck. Oh, yeah. Um, but blueberry okay. concentrate, 100% pure, is available. It's incredibly expensive. Yeah. Every time I see a bill for like one drum of something like black currant or blueberry, mm-hmm. uh, it's it staggers, <laughs> like just <laughs> blows my mind. Um, but so we do that primarily. Um, there are a few exceptions. There are things that we use in their their non concentrated form but mm-hmm. usually for like 500 or 1000 gallon batches smaller batches for us um that are our sour series things mm-hmm. where we're putting a huge amount of time energy and attention into um we're, we, we baby those um so i put them in the primary the one exception which we no longer use mm-hmm. uh for reasons not having to do with um logistics or cost or anything but because we're now a kosher facility 
and raisin is grape and grape has special rules for koshering. Mm-hmm. Um, we do not use raisin concentrate anymore. A product I did not know existed, by the way. It yeah, I've looked- actually used a raisin concentrate for something have before. You? I have. Oh, I yeah, it's it. awesome. The stuff's awesome, but we it, can't use that. Anymore. It is I very mean, interesting. We could have someone come in and, like, look at the tank. And, oh, yeah. But we, we don't. Um, that is something I put in the secondary. Mm-hmm. And uh, I do that in part because it functions as a yeast nutrient as well. Hmm. So not a super strong one. But uh, molasses and raisin juice concentrate both have high minerality enough mm-hmm. that if you've got a yeast population, especially if you're reintroducing a small amount of oxygen, mm-hmm. you can get some of your yeast colony to go back through a budding and reproduction stage, okay. which you need at higher levels. And I did say earlier, there's one exception to our staggered nutrient. Mm-hmm. Um, anything above 15.1% alcohol, we add throughout the fermentation three different yeast strains with three different nutrient additions. Interesting. Okay. So it goes D47 with the, the numbers won't matter to you, but like D47 with four pounds of go firm and eight pounds of Y yeast nutrient. Mm-hmm. Then comes DV10, which I also love, but it's uh-huh. like the howitzer you bring in when nothing else is working. We try to get it in there before there's a potential stall at those high CO2 and alcohol levels. Um, and also we do pump overs for all of our high ABV products, mm-hmm. which is the famous shaking your bucket and degassing it. Um, it's just, you have to buy a very expensive pump to do it. <laughs> yeah. um, and then at the end for one of our products, it's the only product I use this in, uh, we use EC1118. Okay. Which I know it's very popular in home meat making. Mm-hmm. My issue with it has always been that it, um, it's designed for one thing. I was bred to get you high alcohol with blank, like yeah, get you high alcohol. Yeah, and so it's a well-known yeast scrubber. Mm-hmm. Uh, EC eleven eighteen will take if you're buying very expensive honey, you're gonna lose a lot of those flavors with yeah. EC eleven eighteen. But when you're pushing uh, one of our products that was nineteen point one percent alcohol, mm-hmm. there's plenty of flavor in there. Yeah, for sure. This last two percent alcohol the last 16 gravity points uh we use ec1118 with uh go firm and nutrient addition now okay so when you're pitching those because mm-hmm. i know that pitching e- even the ec1118 let's say you get it up to that 13 and a half 14 percent mm-hmm. are you um rehydrating and putting it mm-hmm. straight in are you making a so uh, starter we actually use we use our new beloved bubba tank uh, uh yeah. we mix them all up in there and we oxygenate with wait for it a garden hose. Hey, <laughs> we use I mean, a, a food grade, right, right. very expensive garden hose, but a garden hose. And we just stand there with like, um, Sani gloves on and just spray it in there like a home brewer. And hey. we'll, we'll build it up. Uh, we also do uh, staggered honey additions for, okay. uh, Vanier and Hegier are two okay. very high alcohol products. Um, but yeah, we just spray it in there and when it looks good and frothy, we get out a, big metal mash paddle and we stir that yeast and go firm up and we spray it some more. Um, people are really scared of oxygen introductions into later stages of brewing mm-hmm. beer. You definitely should be mm-hmm. wine. You'll get sherry. Um, yeah. Not everyone's thing for reasons that uh, scientists are still unclear on. And I'm sorry to say there's not a huge amount of money in mead making research um we don't know why mead doesn't respond so negatively to dissolved oxygen Mm. um there are theories out there but i'm not going to give any of them now because we don't have enough data to back them up but a well oxygenated and i wouldn't i wouldn't put use pure o2 if you have that capacity at home i would just really splash it around but a well oxygenated rehydrated yeast and nutrient addition will do more for you uh, later stages of fermentation than anything else. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. That seems like a fun test I want to do at some point is, is add mm-hmm. some oxygen. Actually, I think on my board, yeah, I have oxygen and mead as one of my videos to, to do uh, as an A-B test. I think that'd be Yeah, possible. and if you want to talk, uh, Jake uh, on our staff is the expert on that. Yeah. We'd love to tell you exactly what we do when we add it and all that stuff. I would love to. Um, okay, one la- I got one more question. Yep. 
and this is about developing your palate mm -hmm. as a as somebody who's uh, tried a lot of things um obviously you you've made your palate more expansive over time. Is there any tip or trick you'd give to people, young brewers or really any home mm -hmm. brewer to develop? Yes, absolutely. It's actually where I started most of my brewing career. Um, I was a taster. So I have tasted at a competitive level for beer, wine, cider, and mead. Okay. Um, I also won the best prize I've ever won in my entire life on a scotch tasting competition, but that's not as germane. Um, I correctly fun. identified all five regions of scotch blind. Wow. Um, and what I got as a winner was another flight. And <laughs> my parents who don't drink found me like on this stool speaking Danish to some guy in Scotland. I don't remember them like picking me up and taking me anywhere. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, so the, these are my credentials. Uh, <laughs> as I said, <laughs> at a professional level, uh, yeah. I got to be a judge for like, you know, Utopias, the most expensive beer on earth. I got to judge the flight that contains that. So mm. Mm. Um, it didn't win. It was an amazing beer, but it didn't win its flight. Uh, there's actually a cool brewery out of like Minnesota that had a raspberry uh, sour stout, which doesn't sound like it would be good, but they freaking yeah. nailed it. Anyway, um, so what you can do, turn off the music, get the lights to a moderate level, mm -hmm. and tell everyone to shut up <laughs> every time you drink something. Yeah. Um, I will tell you, having gone through the training for BJCP, um, for international wine competitions, it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. um, it is a level of attention that you probably haven't given to very much uh, since maybe writing a thesis. It's um, hours. It is, in some cases, uh, the the... Everyone has their idea of what hell is and everyone has their idea of what their heaven is going to be like, but I can tell you what purgatory is. <laughs> purgatory is 11 hours of box rosés. Oh. Um, all you want is for one of them to be bad. So at least you can say something. That's a good quote uh, for like this, this, the start of this. Hell is, <laughs> hell is an eternity of box rosés. Um, but it's purgatory because yeah. they're never bad. Yeah. It's purgatory. Oh, yeah. You just sit there at the 11th hour, the sun has set, and you're wondering what you did that made it so that you're there judging box wine cap <laughs> those days. But um, honestly, when I was getting ready to go pro, mm -hmm. I did my Cicerone. I did, um, I did coffee tastings. The thing that you are looking for is an ability to identify off flavors and mm -hmm. subtle flavors. And I don't know if you've ever heard Gary Vaynerchuk, who was a human being mm -hmm. out of his flipping mind, but he started the wine vlog thing. Mm -hmm. Like he literally was, I mean, he's, he's the aughts. I mean, mm -hmm. he's, he's many years into it. And this nut out in like North Jersey and he would do these things in his wine reviews where he'd be like, yeah, you know, when you're a kid and you like took ants and like crushed them in your hand. And I was like, who did that? <laughs> I didn't um, do that. <laughs> he's like, this sure. wine has that aroma. It's, it smells like crushed ants. And I was like, Oh, that's formic acid. That was like, I happen to know that. But yeah. Um, his, my favorite that he ever did was like, oh, you know, when you're a kid, you use a magnifying glass and melt your GI Joe, that polymer smell, that's what I'm getting off of this. But that's probably an issue with, and the guy's a nut, but also a genius. Yeah. But that's how I learned and got to those levels, um, was actually sitting with my wife, as I said, who is my boss. She owns mm -hmm. my meadery. Um, we would sit there together and if you thought it, you were allowed to say it. Mm -hmm. but like in our tastings, and we've done, again, scotch, coffee, wine, tons of things together. Mm -hmm. Sit with a friend when it's safe, seven feet apart, whatever. Yeah. Um, sit with a friend 
And so you know what I'm getting? You know when you first open like a new action figure and there's like, you can smell the two different plastics together. If that's what pops into your head, say it out loud. Mm -hmm. And the number of times your friend will be like, oh my God. And my favorite that I ever brewed was I I ran this crazy experiment. We called it uh, turkey wine because it had everything from a Thanksgiving dinner except for the turkey in it. (laughs) So it like sweet potatoes, marshmallows, cranberries, Oh, wow. um, it was just, it was just nuts. It was my home brewing days and, uh, came out to like 17% alcohol. And I, oh my God, if you want, I would like never went away. Like I still feel like I have the mouthfeel from this uh-huh. thing because I didn't know how to work with sweet potatoes at the time. So like, it just like stuck to the yeah. inside of your mouth. My, and it was on draft. Like it was on draft at my house and my friend loved it. And he was uh-huh. like, I love it because it's like drinking grape nuts. And I was like, oh my God, you're right. Yeah. I don't know why it's like drinking grape nuts, but you are correct. I'm glad you like that. Um, so that's the best way to expand your palate is to pay attention. Mm-hmm. And if you really want to get to the upper echelons, mm-hmm. like if you really want to be able to find flaws and faults, because I'm, if, if there are 10 levels, I'm level one. Like I've gotten to sit in the room with levels seven and eight. There are only a couple tens on earth. Um, yeah. But like I got to sit in a room with people who taste for Miller. Yeah. And we might not all like Miller High Life, but these people can perceive things mm-hmm. that according to science, humans shouldn't be able to differentiate. Yeah. Um, but what they do is they talk about it, but they do it in a quiet space and they give over their full attention to it. And mm-hmm. if it seems exhausting and silly, you're right. But I went through four or five years of it. And now, you know, I've lost a lot of it. I could probably get it back. Mm -hmm. But. Well, it's it's all research. I mean, if you think about if you're going to go study and do something like you're going to go somewhere quiet, you're going to you're going to put your attention to that specific subject. And we I feel like we often equate drinks because everything other than um, really nice alcohols, we just drink without thinking. So I, I think that's great. Um, yeah, that pal- palate fun. development's tough. It is it's fun, exhausting, but it's fun. Yeah, I, um, I'm definitely. Um, I don't. You know, you said you're a one. I feel like I'm like getting in the negatives because I, you know, I, it's just it's tough, but um, it takes time. So yeah. Um, another thing you can do mm-hmm. if you want to do a food thing to push your palate, barbecue. Barbecue, okay. yeah. believe it or not, has a lot of um, compounds, chemical compounds mm-hmm. that can be produced by yeast. Um, I want to have the smoke, obviously. Mm-hmm. I mean, good. Um, I use lapsang suchong to make my smoky meats, but um, eat foods that are subtle and complex mm-hmm. and foods that are super intense. Mm-hmm. Really good barbecue, I think, should be subtle and complex, but you live in the right place for it. You're, yeah. You're a, yeah. Uh, I'm right. You're at the crossroads of the three of the five major types of barbecue. Mm -hmm. Uh, No, that's pay attention. Um, I don't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. I cook for a couple hours every day and I don't pay attention to my food when I'm actually eating it, except to figure out what I screwed up. But it's especially when you can grab two or three friends, some of whom are also experts and Mm -hmm. some who don't know anything Um, and I got a guy doing a coffee tasting with me, like at a commercial level who did not really know anything about coffee. Wasn't much of a coffee Hmm. drinker. He's like, you know what I like about this? It smells, my uncle actually kept like an old fashioned hay barn and it smells like dung, you know, (laughs) like, like shit. And I was like, you're not wrong. (laughs) You're not wrong. Yeah. And so having someone in there that just like calls it like she sees them, Mm -hmm. um, is also really, really nice. Man. But drink a lot. I can't yeah. say that legally, but like that's the other way to expand your palate. Drink a lot, but pay attention when you. Yeah, do. and and just try things. And this is I, now I want to take a moment and highlight um, Girl and Fell specifically, but also I'm going to highlight some uh, meaders in general. If you guys are listening to this and you want to try any of Ricky's meads and also um, Havoc, which to be honest, I don't know the correlation between you guys, you and Havoc. Um, we had no competition, so they're both me. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, Grunfell is um, every single product on the Grunfell side. I can point to the historical recipe that it was based on. Havoc is my playground. So that's okay. why our okay. flowers and our coffee meads are in the Havoc area. So, and um, I'll put the website down below, but go check out the Grunfell and Havoc meaderies. Um, they're obviously creating lots of amazing stuff. I can say firsthand, I've tried, I ordered some a little while ago, actually, and did some reviews and stuff, and it was really good. So I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, and I also want to point to anybody listening to this, watching this, make sure you're supporting any meadery around you. If you live anywhere that has a meadery, the only way we're going to continue to grow this world is by supporting those other people. There are, I was going to say there are a handful of people available online. Uh, I think bee nectar is available in Mm -hmm. most States. Um, but yeah, go to your local folks and, Anyone that's small, anyone that's a garage meadery mm-hmm. is hurting right now. They're hurting yeah. really yeah. bad. Well, they and, live on farmer's markets and local shops and maybe a local restaurant. And we want to, like as, as home brewers, some of us or some people are going to go and try and open their own meaderies and do those things. And hopefully if you do that, you're going to have people purchasing your product. So it's kind of like, you know, give – and then yeah, hopefully with pro quo um, the <laughs> yeah. other thing on that front is um i do not charge for consulting if you want to go pro um ricky at grunfeld.com it's publicly available shoot me an email unless it's the month that i'm away on paternal leave uh-huh. um i will i'll email you back yeah well ricky um thank you so much for spending your time i i've really enjoyed getting to do this and i promise you i i have a whole i didn't have them on here but i just through talking we've i've formulated a bunch of questions for you so i guarantee you there will be another um uh episode of, of podcast with you on it because i would love to chat with you more i i feel like you're a wealth of knowledge and uh just getting to talk to you i'm, I'm learning quite a bit so thank you and it was such an honor like to feel like i don't need to do youtube videos anymore because you have it is just the greatest load off my shoulders well so thank you sir well i'll do what i can but you everyone listening should also go check out ricky's channel it's ask the mead maker you look up ricky or ask whatever just type in mead and you'll find some of his videos um and he's he is a great guy. Obviously you've heard from him this entire time and um, he has a lot of fun videos as well. It's a good deep dive if you're ever uh, wanting to watch some stuff. So Ricky, thanks for your time, man. I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day and your new years and, and do all those things. And it's been, it's been fun, man. Absolute pleasure. Thanks.